the Catholic vision for family life, for community, for, for how we live our lives in the public sphere as Catholics is truly countercultural. It is mind blowing and it's deeply compelling to a person who's like, you know what? I've seen what else is out there and it's tired. It's old. It's, it's not filling me with what I need, with what I'm made to be like, how I meant to live. It's true. And Soren and Ever Johnson, this week on the show, join me to discuss the absolutely incredible Catholic underpinning of what the, 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 the church, at its heart, at its beating heart, understands and wants for the family, for community, for discipleship, for walking together with other Catholics, building meaningful communities in parishes. It's an amazing conversation. Please do watch this, enjoy it, and leave some comments below, guys. Tell us what you think. I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> it's going to rock your socks off. It's great to meet you, Keith. Absolutely. Hey, guys, welcome back to the show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you are listening on podcasts, uh, on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, please just uh, pause for a minute, leave a rating and a review. Those ratings and reviews help to push the podcast out to many more people and they can hear conversations like this one. If you are watching on YouTube, thank you for watching. Please join our growing channel and interact in the comments there, guys. Let us know what you think of these conversations and please do get involved. There's lots to say, lots to hear this week. I am pleased to be joined by Soren and Ever John. And they are the founders and directors of Trinity House Community. They have been married for 22 years, the parents of five children. Uh, Soren previously was the director of uh, communications and evangelization for the Diocese of Arlington, Virginia, uh, and spent 10 years as a research assistant for the papal biographer George Weigel. That's awesome. They both have master's degrees in theology, and they're the authors of Heaven in Your Home, Letters and Guides Year One, edited their whole Trinity House uh, initiative. We'll hear lots more about that, um, amongst many other things they're doing, and they can tell you more as well. Uh, Soren Ever, thank you for being here. Welcome to the show, and hello. Wonderful to be with you, Keith. Thank you. Thank I you so much for having us. Thrilled to have you on the show. I, there's much more I can say about you to <laughs> introduce you guys. You know, you're, you're sitting there, I believe, in your beautiful kind of cafe, your little hub, right, uh, for the, for the, um, the, the ministry. There's so much in that. It, it's amazing and it's fantastic. And I want to get into that. But, but Soren, you're a convert and many listeners to this show, viewers to this show um, are on that journey or are, are, have crossed the Tiber, have their own story. A conversation like this for me is deeply resonant for those, especially those, those people who are looking into the Catholic faith and are kind of going, yeah, but I have all this community back in my evangelical church. We're, we're building small groups, discipleship. We get together and break bread. We raise our kids together in, in the in our evangelical faith. Nothing like that exists. In, 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 where is that in the Catholic Church? And I have my own story like that to tell, and, and I'll get into that. But what you guys do is beautiful and brilliant and so geared towards those who are wondering if this kind of thing exists in the Catholic Church. So that's brilliant. But Soren, I want to maybe hear a bit about, I mean, a thumbnail sketch first of your conversion journey, what brought you into the Catholic faith. And we can we can start there and then launch into the other stuff once that's out of the way. What do you think? Does that, does that, make, does that seem fair? <laughs> Sounds great. Where does, it, where does it begin for you? Well, the... I grew up um, in a wonderful Christian home, non-denominational. Yeah. Um, I would say broadly in the Anabaptist tradition um, in the suburbs of Chicago. And my dad was a pastor's kid. Uh, his father was an evangelical Free Church of America pastor, uh, first generation American um, from uh, his parents from Sweden. So uh, being raised by a pastor's kid was uh, definitely quite an experience. You know, we were, we were regular attenders of, of our local church, very involved. Um, my mom singing in the choir, uh, always involved in Bible studies, youth group. Uh, so I had a, just a, I'm so grateful for the upbringing yeah, I had. Yeah, yeah. Um, a very loving Christian home, very close to the to the Word of God, memorizing Scripture, uh, prayer together as a family, and that's uh, just a, a background I'm so grateful for. 
Yeah, br- brilliant, brilliant. What, 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 what drew you into the Catholic faith from a background like like that? First of all, I got to say, my wife and I went to an Anabaptist uh, college, and so I, I feel like what you're doing here, here, this community stuff, draws draws out of that tradition maybe in your in your past. Because that's immediately what I think of when I think of these kind of communities. What drew you out of that into the into the Catholic faith? Yeah, well, in college, I was still uh, very active in my college, uh, non-denominational Catholic fellowship, uh, sorry, non-denominational fellowship, and, uh, you know, leading Bible studies, uh, playing guitar on the music team, uh, and I really sensed um, at the beginning in college as I was studying scripture, um, I would I would want to get ahead of the people who were in my Bible study, you know, just kind of study up, <laughs> uh, see, act like I know what I was talking about. And um, I'd go to the commentaries at the library, and uh, I kept just kept coming across St. Augustine, St. Jerome, St. John Chrysostom, and I had no idea, uh, you know, who these uh I'd later come to see the church fathers. So that began for me. Um, here I was starting to kind of pull from St. Augustine as I went into one of these Bible studies. And, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and then uh, really, I, I guess it began for me what really became kind of a four year pilgrimage before I was received into the Catholic Church, a time when I was really sensing at first that I was going to go into the ministry as an evangelical Protestant pastor. Uh, So that took me to seminary. I spent a year at Princeton Theological Seminary. And it was um, actually at Princeton where my Protestantism fell apart. I really, um, at that time, I had already had so much more exposure to the kind of sweep of the 2000 years of Christian history. Um, I was feeling a, a very palpable pull towards the Eucharist, towards the sacraments such as confession. And I was starting to kind of stop by a mass here and there to kind of sit in the back. <laughs> and uh, so I walked across the street from Princeton Theological Seminary to the Aquinas um, Institute, the Catholic um, Student Center, spoke with a priest there, said, hey, would you be willing to go through the catechism with me? (laughs) And sure enough, I got a one-on-one kind of tour through the catechism with a very special priest there. And that was really kind of, um, at that moment, I was really seeing, I'm not in the protest. I, I really, my heart was pulling me so strongly to the mass that uh, I started to make steps towards our CIA. <laughs> That's a brilliant. I love that. Wasn't in the protest anymore. Isn't that, <laughs> isn't that so true? Yeah. I, I think that's incredible. But I want to add something about Soren's conversion journey that I think your viewers would be really interested in. Yeah. Um, he was leaving out a, a whole um, part of the journey because he was trying to be brief <laughs> and I won't really go into it, but I do want your viewers to know. Um, Soren started traveling to Russia with his grandmother when he was in high school to work with the uh, Baptist missions in, in Russia. And he he um, got a front row seat on Eastern Orthodoxy. And that was kind of his first um, eye-opening experience of sort of traditional Christianity. And it got his wheels um, spinning there. So that was an entire stream of his uh, conversion journey was he went back and lived and worked in Russia several times. And he he did Russian Eastern European studies in college. So he was um, full on orthodoxy and. I just thought your viewers would be interested to know in the end, of course, he's half Swedish and half Dutch. Yeah. But for a long time, he never even looked at Catholicism because orthodoxy was so unusual 
you know, it, it's not Western. It's not what you're used to. Yeah. And his family wasn't particularly anti-Catholic, but of course that's in the air in the U S in, in North America is a little bit of anti-Catholic, whereas Russian Orthodoxy or different forms of Eastern Orthodoxy look more exotic and more interesting. Yes. And so a lot of people are really looking at both. And I just thought they would be interested to know Soren went, you know, kind of all in and he, he even speaks Russian and he has so many um, Russian and Eastern Orthodox friends when he lived in Jerusalem with Orthodox communities there and did the whole nine yards and then came um, back around and said, hey, there's a Western version of this. <laughs> that feels a little bit more like home for me as half Swedish and half Dutch. I'm Irish, but um, yeah. So I thought you, you guys would want to know uh, about that. As well. <laughs> he, yeah. he did keep it brief, didn't he? That, that's an, awesome, <laughs> he that's an awesome detail. And you know, that's a great point ever. And I've heard lots of guests on the show and in my, in my own experience, you know, you look into Eastern Orthodoxy first in some cases because it yeah. seems it doesn't have the baggage exactly. of, the, of the Catholic Church in the West, right? Yeah, and exactly. I have, I've had lots of, of guests in the show describe that same journey. And actually, the per first person that I knew who was a convert to anything was a convert to Eastern Orthodoxy. And I asked him tons of questions. Yeah. For me and many of the guests in the show have described that journey, it's ultimately, you know, it doesn't settle the things that a, a, a pope can settle, the true... Yeah church is united the bishops are united and can make decisions can settle because there's still that that kind of fractured geographic kind of cultural ethnic uh, yes. you know problem with orthodoxy that they can't actually settle things in the way that say a united church could settle was that anywhere in or more just that kind of i'm more familiar with this kind of thing soren what does it make sense oh yeah definitely yes that um scene the kind of within the United States, 17 different Orthodox jurisdictions sure, yeah. and a very kind of, uh, uh, I don't know about horizontal, but a, a view of authority that is really coming from the different um, autocephalous churches and the different patriarchates. So the uh, definitely encountered that sense of, uh, you know, authority within the Eastern Orthodox Church and um, so much that I uh, loved and continue to love um, with the Eastern, if you will, lung um, and w the experience of um, Eastern Orthodoxy. Hope to bring it into the present. And uh, here we are right before the uh, <laughs> Trinity icon behind us, uh, which is a, you know, a copy of a yeah. Russian Orthodox uh, yeah. icon. Yeah. yeah, that's that's amazing. That's that's an awesome that's an awesome story. And I know the origin story of the work that you guys do is also pretty pretty cool. Uh, and and like I said before, I think so important such an important aspect of of Catholic life. Okay, that is sometimes truncated. You know, we're not. I recently had a, you know, a Protestant pastor friend of mine. I saw a couple of things he'd put out there on, on social media. And he was talking about these un, I think he used the word unformed Christians, right? Unformed evangelical Christians. And that's what we would have described Catholics as surely when, when we were, you know, when I was an evangelical Christian, here are all these unformed Catholics, uncatechized is the word we Catholics use on the inside, uncatechized Catholics who don't realize the importance of say, family, of community, of intentionally living these things out in certain patterns and, and certain ways and, and discipleship, you know, walking alongside other people. And like I said before, so, so many of us look at, you know, from the outside, look at the Catholic faith and see, you know, Catholic people just, you know, doing the mass and then kind of going home and that's kind of it. Or they're there on Easter or on Christmas or, you know, the Catholics we know, the Catholics I knew in many cases were the guys who were really checked out of their faith or the ex-Catholics who I met in the evangelical church who didn't know their, you know, it turns out, didn't know their faith very well. What they left wasn't really the Catholic faith to begin with. But these are the examples looking from the outside at so many of the, the, the Catholics that that we knew. And I can even think of my very first experience 
I finished RCIA at a very sleepy parish. I became Catholic first. My wife became Catholic the year after me. I was kind of a bit jumping the gun. I probably should discuss things more with her and made a better plan, but I really kind of jumped the gun and really just called up the closest parish, found a religious sister who was running the program and kind of jumped in and then checked the boxes off afterwards in our marriage, which caused all kinds of turmoil, but we made it. And <laughs> when I when I, when I I finished that program, like the last day of that RCA program was the official like, okay, so the, the mystagogy, like the you're now in, here are the things that draw you deeper. And it's supposed to be you know, those drawing you deeper things. And I remember the the sister brought out this pamphlet and it it wasn't even photocopied. It was like Xenotype, like, pre, you know, pre-Xerox, <laughs> like, you know, photocopying, like this kind of, you know, the, this really old fashioned system of photocopying. This paper was like, you know, a certain kind of paper and the ink is a certain kind of ink on there. And you can tell it's not, it's old. And it was this list of ways to get involved in the faith now that you're Catholic. And I remember, like, I, I was excited. I'm like, okay, so you know, yeah, small groups and different ministries, and you know, connecting with other people and Bible studies and like, you know, family groups, all this great stuff. And I open it. You guys can probably predict where this is going, but I open it, and it's you know, it, it's things like, you know, the altar guild, so you can you can help yeah. clean the linens for the altar. It was things like something called adult babysitters. Which I think, which I think, didn't babysit adults. I think it was meant for like, you know, grandmas and grandpas to hold babies during mass for families who, right? There was, there were, that was kind of the end of the, the sewing club. I think was like the only other thing on there, and it was kind of this realization that wow, like at least in this parish, my first exposure to Catholics at the parish level, once it was Catholic, was like, these guys aren't doing community. There's nothing for people who become Catholic to, to dig in deeper and learn more about their faith and do that faith with other people. So I'm, I'm sorry I'm talking a lot here, but this is, what, you, what you guys do excites me. And I think so many people have that similar experience where, okay, now I'm Catholic. Well, what next? Because there's not a lot out there in many parishes to actually walk that walk now, I yeah. don't think. So, so maybe all that to say, like, what, what are you guys doing and I think where did it where did it start? I think is the best way to explain what is what it's become, right? Um, well, um, Trinity House community origins are almost as old as our relationship. We um, met in the jubilee year of two thousand in Krakow, Poland, on a Catholic social teaching seminar, and um, fell in love right away. And knew, you know, from very early on that we would like to go into full-time ministry together. And at that time, of course, um, Pope John Paul II was talking so much about bringing the riches of the faith into the public square. And he kept saying, new evangelization, new evangelization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he kept saying, listen, you lay people, if you take your responsibility to evangelize formerly Christian culture, seriously, we will have a new springtime for the church yeah. and for humankind in the third millennium. And everyone, you know, we knew was perking up their ears and hearing this. And I grew up on it, that message. And we knew, you know, this is serious. He's talking to us, you know, and um, what are we going to do about it? So, you know, it's been a very long process of discernment and steps uh, to where we are today, but it started way back there in, in 2000. So um, I guess a short way of answering your question is say uh, the Trinity House community, our, our mission is to help families make home a taste of heaven for the renewal of faith and culture. And we do that in three ways. We engage the public here at Trinity House Cafe and Market with a sort of vision for the Christian home and a renewal of Christian community in our town. And uh, we also equip parents with all sorts of um, tools. Uh, the Heaven in Your Home workshop, our weekly uh, letters, uh, our new Heaven in Your Home book. I'll hold it up here. You mentioned it earlier. <laughs> It's, it's beautiful, by the way. It's coming in your home. And um, then we also encourage families in parish based groups called Trinity House Community Groups. So that's kind of uh, what we do in a nutshell. 
<laughs> and it, first of all, what a fantastic place to meet. I couldn't imagine a better place to meet your spouse than that, that kind of a, a, a seminar. Like that's just, you're set for life. Like you guys are, you know, they're the right person if that's, if that's where you're meeting. Did you, I'm, I'm wondering, so at that time you're, you're hearing the new evangelization. And of course, a lot, I, I as a convert am a recipient of a lot of that at that time that was kind of beginning. I can think of the very first, the, actually he was Dutch, Father Roderick Vonnegut, a lovely Dutch podcasting priest who, you know, spurred on by those words and that mission began to like evangelize on the internet and began to launch a podcast. And I got into podcasting, listen, you know, and got into kind of a, a soft, my, my soft entry into the Catholic faith was hearing this Dutch, you know, priest talking wow. about video games and movies and things, and wow. also, and also the Catholic faith. And I went, I went, wow, this guy, first of all, as an evangelical with, like you said before, uh, ever, there's just in the air you breathe, there's kind of the anti-Catholic kind of ideas. Mm -hmm. And that was me, you know, coming with those, just that in the air. And here I was meeting this, this Catholic priest in my ears every day as I went to work in this warehouse during my summer terms in university. And he's talking about the Catholic faith from an authentic place. Like he, he can explain why he believes things and he's passionate about it. And I thought, wow. wait, wait a minute, Catholics are like real people. Priests are real people and they know <laughs> their faith and, and love it deeply. Like that was a, that was a shock for me. <laughs> but, that came out of the new evangelization, this mission, like we have to go back out into the culture. And so I, I, I love that that's part of your genesis. And so you must have seen, you know, a place where you guys could carve out that for you. Like this was, a, this, you know, Father Roderick was a, a geeky priest who knew how to work a microphone. He had a broadcasting background. So that was his way of doing that. You guys must have discerned a way for you guys as, as a couple to begin that. It was, was it a conversation? I guess when you, you, know, you met in the right place. You obviously had that both on, yes. on your hearts. Was that kind of immediately this, this thing in your heart that we got to do this? And it was this, this fully formed vision that you launched <laughs> forward? If only. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I think it the definitely was unfolding in those early years of marriage, um, married in 2001 and settled down in Washington, D.C. and within two years, uh, beginning our family and uh, just so many conversations with just amazing Catholics and evangelicals, Protestants, Eastern Orthodox in the D.C. area. And we, you know, I uh, ever hasn't mentioned this, but I married into a movement uh, ever is one of 12 and just an incredible Catholic family from Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, two of her sisters are in religious life, uh, one a Carmelite and one a Franciscan sister of the Eucharist. And I just mentioned that because Ever also grew up in a restaurant family, hosting others, constantly having the yeah, doors open, yeah, yeah. Uh, not quite sure who was coming for dinner that night. Yeah. And uh, just a really beautiful, generous, magnanimous, hosp hospitable family. So early on in our marriage, we found a certain joy in hosting others, even as we were beginning our family. And we started, we, we formed a nonprofit. We started young adult events in the D.C. area that really combined a lot of what we saw in Krakow, which was just uh, kind of an immersive Catholic culture that combines fellowship, yeah. worship, a meal, and some formation. And we would do that in parish halls and we would set up these uh, aluminum chairs and turn on the fluorescent lights. And, and we would turn off the <laughs> Yes, lights. we would turn them off and then ever would make it, you know, candlelight, yes, yes, um, yes. beautiful, you know, tablecloths and centerpieces. It was really hard to make it look nice. You know, <laughs> yeah. The floor it. Yep. And the fluorescent lights. Yes. Yeah. Yep. We've been and, there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you've been there. And so, uh, but you know, it was, it was really encouraging for us alongside of our kind of more full-time jobs at that time to really be starting this, um, starting these meetings of young people. Um, and that, grew and eventually we really came to this point of saying 
why are we doing this in parish halls and basements? What if we got out to the public square yeah. and um, did this through a cafe? Well, and I was so tired of setting up these events in parish yeah. halls. I <laughs> stupidly thought it would be easier to just open a cafe and have it set up <laughs> once and for all. <laughs> I really thought, you know, I'm just so tired of lugging these bins into the parish hall. Let, let me open a business that I have to be presentable, you know, every day of the week except Sunday. I don't know what I was thinking. It's uh, a little bit harder to have a cafe um, events. Just a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. And I, I laugh too because, and I said, I, I, I've been there. My wife and I, one of the final things that we did in a non-denominational church before we converted and left that community we helped to run a married couples ministry and we were in a you know in the in the parish hall at this lutheran church setting up at, you know once a month dragging out the bins and setting up the decorations yeah. and turning the lights off and, and putting the candles up it's <laughs> it is a lot a lot of work right to make yeah. that space into something that is inviting and I, gosh there's there's so much in this guys in that that model right that model of the the meal the discussion that 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 fellowship i can think of you know for us and again i'm going to keep saying this but for many converts because people listening to the show are kind of on that journey for me there was an intellectual conversion in in, a, in large part when i became catholic it was researching the early church yeah. re, you know reading tons of tons of books watching all kinds of uh, lectures and debates and courses and stuff and talking to yes. really smart people for my wife, a large part of that, now that was definitely part of it for her, but a large part of that was, you know, I, I converted and she goes, yeah, okay, that's great, but we got to find a place to raise our kids in if exactly. I'm going to be able to become Catholic. So for her, it was a lot of that, that relational, that family aspect. Well, okay, yes. great. Intellectually, this faith makes sense. I, I understand the origins, the history, the theology yeah. deeply better than I did in many cases. But it was that, okay, we got to find a parish that that has something to offer our family beyond just, and the sacraments are great. Don't get me, don't get, a, get me wrong. Don't get, she didn't right. mean that either, but not just going to mass, receiving the sacraments, you know, going to confession once a month, going home and living our kind of separate lives, right? For right. her, it was that relational aspect that that she was yeah. looking for to draw in our whole family, you know, thinking ahead to the kids we'd have and we oh, found important. a we found a parish and i knew it was the right one because i went there by myself to test the waters out one saturday evening for mass and afterwards they had an ice cream party in the parish hall and i'm like what what kind of church has mass and an ice cream party afterwards but it was a sun it was a sunday sunday and this was the vigil mass oh. sunday sunday and the point was to, to fellowship, to allow young families, especially, a chance to stay after Mass, yeah. to meet one another, to fellowship, to chat, so the kids can run around and they can do their thing, right? Well, well, sister ushers them around, right, and kind of takes the kids under her fold. It, it was beautiful. And I came home and I said, I said babe, I've, I've got the thing we're looking for. And I brought her, and of course, that was the parish. She, was, she came into the church there, confirmed our son was baptized when he was born a little bit later. You know, that was that was it. But right, it was that aspect that's missing in many places exactly. that that you guys have a have a a hold on, right? That bringing that into into the culture, right? That that lifestyle, that that understanding that the faith is more than just the sacraments and going home and you're done, right? Yes. Exactly. Yes. Oh, amen to everything you just said, Keith. And it just, it resonates so deeply. Um, Ever has sometimes um, said that um, for many of our Protestant brothers and sisters, the sacrament is fellowship. Yes. And it just kind of, it kind of embodies a little bit of, of what we're talking about here, which is a very high view of fellowship that we, that we should have. Yes. And, you know, back to that immersive experience, I can't agree more. You know, when you have your first child and you're thinking, okay, well, I mean, who am I introducing them to at mass? And where's the, where's the community? It just, your heart longs for it. And if we are made in the image of the Trinity 
and the Trinity is a communion of persons, the, the Trinity is relationship. I mean, why? It's just the most obvious thing in the world that we need this um, life giving sense of friendship, fellowship in our local parish. And I mean, as you know, it's just lacking in so many, so many Catholic parishes, but we are just so excited to see many, you know, seeds of renewal, many parishes that are are really turning the tide there. Yeah. Yeah. That that's that's amazing. You you call this the Trinity House Way. What is that what does this mean? This is this I I love that idea of the the relational aspect of the Trinity and of course that's what we're we're called to do. What what does it mean? Well, we have a whole model for family life um, that we teach the families in our parish-based groups. And it's all uh, centered around a teaching from the catechism. The Christian family is a communion of persons, a sign and image of the love between the Father and the Son in the Holy Spirit. So just taking off on that teaching that the family is a communion of persons in the image of the Trinity we uh, take that kind of as our core concept for the Trinity House community. And we teach families if we can learn to live together like the, the persons of God live together in an other centered communion that, of course, is very creative, um, that creates abundant blessings. If we can learn to live together in that way, uh, we can grow into a, a more radiant image of God in our our home can become a taste of heaven that overflows into our neighborhood. So that's our kind of core concept. And uh, just to make it a little bit more practical, we say, well, the Trinity house. So we, you know, encourage our families to reimagine their home as a Trinity house because the family in the home or the domestic church is like the image of God in uh, within the home. So what we, what we say is, you know, you got to take that uh, very ideal concept to, that you may fear you're far from and um, make it more practical. So there are five levels to the Trinity House. And the first level, of course, is the faith life, where we receive our communion from uh, the church, from the sacraments. So, of course, you know, lucky thing, we don't have to create the communion, but communion comes to us from the heart of the Holy Trinity through Mary's yes, through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, through the life of the church in the Mass. On Sunday, the family goes to receive the communion from the heart of God. God gives you his own communion. It's great. You don't have to manufacture it. You bring it into your heart, and you cultivate it throughout the week in the other four levels of the Trinity House. So level two, you develop or deepen the communion in a uh, person and relationships. So you receive that communion from God and you go into level two and you deepen that communion in person and relationships. Level three is household economy. That's where we care for our communion. We use our uh, unique gifts and our teamwork for everyone to uh, make a contribution to care for the communion of the family. Level four is family culture. That's where we celebrate our communion. So you've done a lot of hard work. You've got, you know, you've uh, cultivated the communion that you received from God. You're growing these healthy people and healthy relationships. You've cared for everyone's needs in the household economy. And now you're starting to kind of see the fruits of your communion and you're celebrating in family culture. Of course, that's all those fun things like um, sports and nature and art and literature and music and the things that you enjoy together after the hard work is done. And then that takes us to the crown of a Trinity house, which is level five, hospitality and service. Yeah, so, yeah. of course, if you're creating all this communion and it's other centered, so that makes it creative and abundant, it's starting to overflow and you have something to share. So, you know, you open the doors of your house and invite people into your taste of heaven. So share the life of God that is becoming abundant and overflowing in your family, which of course is so 
counter to what many families experience, which is a sense of scarcity. We barely can get by on, um, you know, using all the resources that we have to take care of ourselves. There's nothing left over. We can't host. We can't get involved in uh, ministries. We're barely making it. And we teach our families how to uh, just turn that whole mentality on its head and say, no, when you bring the life of God into your heart and into your family and you become other centered instead of self centered, something happens, something clicks. So your being is actually working according to the way it was made to work, which is to be endlessly creative with abundant blessings that overflow and provide much more than your family needs for itself and begins to provide for um, things that your neighbors might need or your friends or the people at your parish. So that's level five, the crown of the Trinity house. <laughs> okay. That sounds exhausting. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it, it, it does, but I take your point. And that's beautifully said, beautifully said. I love that. And I'm thinking of so many, you know, I can think of people that, that this is how they operate. If Catholic families, we know that this is how they operate it's as that, that giving to others, despite, cause I, you know, and, and certainly we're paralyzed by this at times too, right? The exhaustion of, of four kids, four young kids, and things aren't ready. Things aren't set. We're exhausted. We can't mentally make it through. And I see families like us, right? And we try and model this too for others on our best days, right? Who are giving of themselves regardless of how, what things might might be, right? The things aren't ready, aren't settled. I, I, I can't do this. I don't have anything. All my ducks lined up in a row, <laughs> but are still able to, to give of themselves. I wonder what you guys have seen as you implement this, as you see, as you, you know, you coach families in this model, as you, you know, mentor groups, as groups start up that, that follow this framework. I'm, I'm, the fruits of that must be pretty incredible because as you described, like if this is, if this can be achieved, right? And of course, God gives you that grace and that ability to do those things and the resources yeah. to do those things if you begin to ask and, and seek that, right? Of course he would. What have you, what have you seen in the ground with people living out this vision? That sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, I, I think of three main things that we're seeing on the ground. The first one is that parents are recapturing a vision for their home, their domestic church, their family, their domestic, uh, their Trinity house. You know, the world is throwing so many different visions at us. Yeah, yeah and yeah. it's very easy to kind of lose sight of the ultimate good of of dwelling with the Lord in our home. So they're they're recapturing that vision, but then they need practical strategies to live this out Monday through Saturday. I mean and to reclaim the Sabbath. So uh, vision and strategies. You know, the second thing that we're seeing is parents are growing in relationship and community with like-minded uh, couples, families yeah, yeah. that are sharing that same ultimate vision. And I'll tell you, it's in our individualistic culture, as you know, I mean, it's very easy to just say, okay, I got to get, I got to get back on track. I got to get, yeah, yeah. but if you're not doing that with community, I mean, good luck. <laughs> I mean, we need it. Yeah. And that's why we are seeing just kind of unlocking um, this kind of dynamic of couples evangelizing couples um, in our Trinity house community groups that are in a growing number of parishes Sure, Ever and I share a 12 minute video. You know, there's a, a brief teaching on your Trinity house. But I've got to say, it's just kind of explosive when you see all of these couples then go into the 20 minutes of discussion yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. And oh, I'm not the only one dealing with this issue. Oh, I'm, I'm not alone in this anxiety that I have. Oh, she just gave me a great tip. He just gave me some courage. And um, so I'd say, you know, the vision, strategies, community, relationship. And then lastly, kids just have a great time at these gatherings. And what we're doing is we're, we're saying, you know, your parish community is not just about, I mean, of course, the mass is 
the summit, the source and summit. But it's it's more than that. You have friends, family, community yeah, yeah. at your parish. So, you know, that's when we see things really start to tip in a parish is when the kids are saying to their parents, hey, when's the next heaven in your home gathering? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that. And I love that. I mean, I love that vision, first of all, of, you know, that the, the parish isn't just for, for, the sacraments. So that's that's the summit. The Eucharist is, of course, the summit of yeah. that. But it exists as a space, a time and place that, that gathers us in, right? Yeah. I I recently had uh, John Michael Talbot on the show, and he mm -hmm. said, you know, he's been Catholic for a long time in prominent positions and, and talked to probably many popes. Sure. And he said that one time he went to Rome and talked to one of the popes, I think it was probably John Paul II at the time, who was really lamenting the fact that you know, he wasn't sure, and those people in the Vatican who were working with him and 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 I think instructing priests and and teaching the faith weren't sure that Catholicism was compatible with the the West, like, like America, North America, because he said it's so individualistic in America that they you know they're skeptical if they could actually build communities, you know, because the Catholic faith is communal. And does that actually fit the you know the the way this the America is is set up? Very individualistic lives. So I think you know I I've been thinking of that since I since I spoke to him, and thinking of the idea like you know what it's so true how individualized we are in Canada as well in the states, but also how communal the Catholic faith is. Mm -hmm. Right, the prayers we pray at Mass are all communal. We're asking each other to pray for. Yeah. each other right in, 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 you know for the, to, to god to help for our sins to be forgiven and we're praying for each other's needs during the mass we're bringing together our own kind of sacrifices to the mass to to give to christ along you know alongside the, the priest like we're doing it's a communal aspect and all the sacraments are the same right they're, they're communal confession is is by yourself with a priest, but you're confessing your sins because you're part of a community and part of the things you've done wrong is broken that relationship with other, you know, people in that community. So anything we do to, to, to you know, wake people up to the fact that, yeah, there's, this is a community. We gotta be working together, fellowshipping together, right? It, it's, you know, it's not a sacrament, but like, but you know, ever i love that idea of that's the kind of the evangelical sacrament it is that's the one thing that so many people that i've talked to say yeah evangelicals get this right they get the fellowship part right they get the doing life together part right so whatever we can do to to work towards you know uniting families and having those discussions and those moments like that's yeah that's what the church needs to i think indisputably work towards right Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think of I'm not just mentioning this storm because you have a connection, but I read George Weigel's, I think it was Evangelical Catholicism. Uh, it's, a, it's a purple book. Sure. Early on in my journey, because I was curious, the title kind of drew me in. I was reading a thousand books a day at that point. And he <laughs> talks about the, the the change in like American Western Catholicism. They kind of changed from these these kind of ghettos of Catholic ethnic families, right? So the, right, so, you know, my my Polish ancestors came to Canada and set up, like, you know, a Polish Catholic area of town, right? Or of that city. Like the Irish, you know, came over, like the Italians came over, the French, they all settled in like Montreal, right? And began a huge Catholic community there. And the air, right, your, your, your orbit, your ecosystem, where you, where you lived was Catholic. Right, yeah. the grocer was Catholic. Your school was Catholic. Your neighbors were Catholic. Your family was all there too. They were all Catholic, and so you were catechized in this environment where everything kind of was Catholic. Like the just the yes. air was the air was Catholic. It wasn't always a great catechesis, but it was <laughs> it was genuinely living that Catholic life. That we yeah. yeah. that is, and he mentioned in this book how that shifted. Those communities have kind of split apart as people move out and expand and, and right, like things change socioeconomically, right? And how there is then that need now to 
evangelize people to move back into like the communities that, that, you, that you're building to intentionally build those communities because they yeah. don't just de facto exist anymore right that idea of it's got to be intentional yes 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 absolutely you know um john paul ii said the future of humanity passes by way of the family and we really i mean just to you know reiterate what you're saying keith this immersive catholic culture has to be tasted first in the home experienced yeah, right, within yeah. the four walls of our home. Like we could move to a, a Catholic Disneyland. We could move to a Catholic, you know, like uh, just the most perfect set of Catholic families in the world. But if you are not living it in your own, within the four walls of your own home, it, it's not going to make much of a difference. So I think that's, I think, you know, despite the strongly individualistic culture that we are in, um, authentic community is very attractive and we are in an epidemic of loneliness Yeah, and our hearts respond when we see community, relationship, authentic Catholic fellowship in action. Um, and so it's, it's it's just kind of opening a door to the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit can really move and work in our families in such powerful ways. I think I just take great joy in uh, working with couples and families that, you know, they they make a small change. They think, you know what, we never really prepared for Sunday. It just suddenly was here yeah. and we went to sports practices. We fit mass in when we could, we went shopping. And, you know, when, when you start to see a family plan for the Sabbath and walk into it and experience God's love and his peace, and then you start to see that cascade throughout the, the week and experience it in, individual and family prayer throughout the week and little bits of a mini Sabbath at dinner as you celebrate your communion. You know, I'm, I'm kind of getting on my, uh, <laughs> starting to preach here, but you know, I think this is what is just so encouraging, you know, a family that says, Hey, we don't have a home altar. Let's set one up. Let's have a focal point of embodied prayer in this yeah, home. Yeah and give God the due that he deserves. And then you start to see families, you know, turn corners. You know, it's interesting. You said, you know, what are the fruits that you're seeing? Those are the most joyous moments when families, and we're talking about good Catholic families, people who go to mass, who have, you know, an understanding of the faith, who want to pass it on to their children saying they've never enjoyed the Sabbath before and that they have felt encouraged and started to plan it out and lean into it and really um, inhabit that uh, beautiful heart of God's love for them and the gift of the Eucharist and just settling into it and resting and being instead of, you know, doing stuff. Yeah. And, uh, we, you know, we help, you, you talked about the vision being exhausting and it, it is exhausting. Um, I'll show you a picture. We actually have the heaven in your home workshop on kind of like on one page. We call it the heaven in your home flow chart. It's, yeah. it's in the book. This is <laughs> what it looks like. <laughs> so you can, um, follow step by step how to how to find heaven in your home and when we show it you know to families at at the heaven in your home workshop oftentimes people are exhausted by it <laughs> but, we, <laughs> but we talk of, we do talk about it as aspirational yeah. and i remember one guy at a workshop saying um oh my goodness this is an intergenerational project <laughs> and it is it yeah. is he said my wife and I hope to get um, quite far in this, but we want to pass it on to our children and they will do a much better job than we will. <laughs> and it's neat, though, to hear kind of like the the first 
steps that people are taking. Yeah. Of, um, we say open the front door of your Trinity house is keeping the Sabbath holy. Because that is the answer to the exhaustion that you're experiencing when yes, you think yeah, about yeah. the whole project. And we, and this is another thing we try to help our families understand. You're never going to get to the crown of a Trinity house, hospitality and service. Okay. It's level five for a reason. That's hard, <laughs> but it's also hard because in our culture, we have a habit of busyness yeah. instead of intentional living. And so we have to turn that around and realize the first step in intentional living and in having the life that you want in leading the life that you want to lead is keeping the Sabbath holy because living the life that you want to live is a gift that God will give you. It's not something that you can create for yourself. So our first step in helping families turn things around is, Hey guys, Let's learn to relax and just be children of God, be in yeah. God's family. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we're going to build our families. Yes, we're going to reach for our ideals and we're going to go through these five levels and we're going to crown our Trinity house and no one's going to stop us. But we have to start by resting yes. in God's love, in the blessed mother's care and being children in God's family. And you have got to open the front door of your Trinity house and keep a Holy Sabbath. And then we talk about, you know, permitting yourself a prayer life, permitting yourself a daily family meal where you rest around, you know, the, that altar of communion within the home, just yeah. your kitchen table and, and just enjoy the nourishment of the love amongst the family members yeah. and understand that, you know, what we have in our culture, the idea that we're supposed to be becoming all the time, doing all the time, running on that little treadmill of busyness is inhumane. It's not what God wants for us. And we'll never achieve the life that we want to live if we don't learn to just be. Yeah. So <laughs> that is the answer to the Amen. exhaustion. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's that's amazing. And again, beautifully said, very well said. And it strikes me how radically, I think that's the right word, it's radically countercultural it so is. much of this is, right? I mean, never mind just like being Catholic, right? Is yeah, increasingly right. <laughs> it's increasingly countercultural and radical. But then if you really embrace this Catholic vision for family, for the domestic church, for community, for relationship that you guys do with the Trinity House, I mean that's that's gonna look very just a hospitality piece, like just that one piece of, you know, inviting, keeping the step with holy. Okay, like right there. That's this, you say step one. Like just that alone is gonna look radically, radically right. different than than the culture, right? Never mind as you progress through the steps, you get to hospitality and you're having people over, opening up your house. Like no one does that anymore, right? That, no. that's that <laughs> your space is your own. You're going to Netflix and yep. chill because you're too busy doing everything else. That's right. Right. It's very, it's very countercultural. And yes. I think Soren, you may have said this compelling. Mm -hmm. like it's, it's both those two things, right? Because, you know, people who are looking at becoming something, becoming Catholic out of no religion or out of a, a non-Christian, a non-Catholic Christian religion, aren't looking for an easy route or something that's going to be boring or bland. Like not, right. No one's converting, right. no one's converting to like for an easier time or like a more, a less interesting time. The people exactly. who are watching this video, listening to the show are looking for that more rigorous experience of Christ and his church. Yes. So it's, it's compelling at the same time that it's radical, right? Yes. It's yes. both those things in tandem, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I just was reminded uh, a couple of weeks ago, I took one of our high school students to do some college visits and we went to a campus orientation session where they just described, you know, what are the characteristics of our incoming class? And the acceptance rate at this school was about 10%. And I'm in this auditorium with a couple hundred parents in their they're, um, you know, 17 year old students. And I could just feel this wave of anxiety coming at me. Like, am I doing enough? 
Is my child building a resume? <laughs> uh, are they maximizing their time? And I'm telling you, I came out of that hour just like really unsettled because it was kind of like a distilled version of what the culture is, is saying. Yeah, 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 this yeah. is what parenting's all about. And I mean, the irony of this is that all of the social science, for example, points to the family meal as a decisive yeah. uh, um, habit that can put your kids on a trajectory for all kinds of success, you know, for decades, for their whole life. Um, and, you know, we're not even talking Catholic research here. We're talking yeah, yeah, social yeah, science yeah. data. Um, so here you are in a college or in a college application setting, the world's coming at you, get busy, get busy. And our Lord is saying the exact opposite every Sunday and then throughout the week. And if we really want to set up our families for long-term, let's, we don't need to use the word success, but you know, the path to holiness, the yeah, path to, good, good. you know, life with God. I mean, wow, we just need to, um, we're going to need to make some tough choices as a family, right? We're going to have to say no to things. We're going to have to guard and protect our Sabbath. We're going to make decisions on a Monday that start to protect the Sabbath starting Saturday night. I mean, life can really, if we're not careful, suddenly 18 years are over. The kids are out the door. They've left the faith. <laughs> Statistically, that's where most of them are going. And did we provide them a, an immersive, loving, tender Catholic home? I, you know, the years are very short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very, very well spoken. I've, I've had so many emails to the show from listeners, people who are inquiring, and that's so many times the where the conversation begins. Hey, look, I'm becoming Catholic, but I have kids, or we want to have kids. How are we going to raise them to stay in the faith? So many people are are leaving. How are we going to, as converts who don't who are learning the faith, going yeah. to raise them in a faith that we're just on the ground learning. I, you, know, you joked a minute ago, Ever, of the idea that the one couple said, well, yeah, this is for our kids. They'll, they'll implement this, you know, we'll try, and they'll they'll do it the proper way with their turn. And that's like, that's a weird, and maybe you know this in a sense, or in a weird experience of the convert that like, you know, you're raising cradle Catholics, but you <laughs> yourself, you yourself are, you know, a convert, you're, you're new to the faith, but you're raising people who will, when, you know, when our kids grow up, they'll go, yeah, I'm a cradle Catholic, yeah. but you know, mom and dad, it, it's such a, it's a weird dichotomy, yeah. right? And so you, so many people write me and ask, you know, have more guests on that talk about how you can raise those kids to, to be Catholic, to stay Catholic, right? To remain Catholic. And I think, hey, here's a great, Here's a ticket, right? That ticket of that making making fellowship important in the home, making the home important. These things like the Sabbath, making that important. Like it, it's the building blocks, right? Of the domestic church that just wraps you, wraps you in in the faith, right? Mm -hmm. That then emanates yes. out everywhere else, right? And draws people in. That that's a compelling picture, right? But it's a it, it's about you know, forming people, I think at a at a core in the home, right in the family, yes. right to then because that is right. And again, this is this is beautiful from you know from Pope John Paul II. Like that's the that's the thing. That's the genesis of of our faith life, right in in, yeah. in the home in that Trinity house, right? Exactly. <laughs> right. We have often had parents in workshops ask us, you know, how do I keep my kids from uh, going off into the culture? And we say, well, the best way that you can do it is to create a radically beautiful and humane and rich culture within your home yeah. so that they see the difference when they go out into the world. Yeah. The problem with so many Christian families is, they are living a secular culture within their home. They believe in the faith, but it's in their head. 
they haven't brought it into an embodied lifestyle that surrounds their beloved family members with beauty and goodness and rich community and uh, beautiful relationships. So they live kind of a cookie cutter secular lifestyle within their home. And they do all the same activities that their secular neighbors do. They live in the exact same way on the busy, busy treadmill. And so what happens is their kids, uh, you know, graduate, go off to college, go out in the world. The world doesn't look any different from what they left behind. So drifting away from the faith doesn't really seem that serious. Um, They, they start, you know, failing to practice the faith, but what really was the faith? Was it something that was in our head? My parents told me it was important, but how did it change the way I lived my life, the way that I felt? Whereas we hope that our children, because they've been raised in an immersive Catholic experience of um, beauty, rich relationships, good community, uh, great art, literature, music, et cetera, all the things that you can't associate with our culture anymore. So we'll see the difference when they go out there to a stripped down materialistic consumerist culture where no one creates anything anymore. All they do is consume mass produced things. They'll say, why would anyone choose this over what we came from? Yeah. which was so humane and so rich and so nourishing and so good. <laughs> so one of the you know things that we teach the parents in the Trinity House model is a principle that goes with each of the five levels. The principle for level four family culture is initiative because, you know, there's a lot of imposters to real culture. Yeah, yeah, there's the, you know, the screen culture and the stripped down materialist consumerist culture. And as Christian parents, we have to take initiative to create an immersive Catholic culture in our home, maybe even in our yard, in our garden with stations of the cross or whatever, you know, beautiful, rich things in our embodied environment that um, help our children just sink into the faith in an embodied way so that they always know and recognize where they go in the world, the difference between what the gospel produces, which is true and good and beautiful, and what the anti-gospel produces, which is empty and a lot of sameness and a lot of consumerism and very little creativity. And they'll see, it won't be hard for them to discern the difference. So... (laughs) You guys are awesome. Amen. <laughs> that's that's awesome stuff. That's so rich. Guys, this has been a fantastic conversation. I want to give you guys a, a chance to talk a bit more about, you know, what what people can can do to get involved or to learn more about this because there's there's such richness in here. It's very exciting. These these kinds of things that, that are building that, you know, that that deeply Catholic, countercultural, immersive kind of experience. You just mentioned, I guess, as a side, you mentioned just even your garden, right, uh, ever. I've wanted a wayside shrine for, for as long as I can remember. Just, you know, put some out there on the front lawn. People can just drive yes. by. They can stop if they want to. The yeah. neighbors will think we're crazy. But, yeah. you know, you're just, I'm going totally. to exactly go up. I'm going yeah, to say it, ever. Gene. Yeah, ever says I got to do this, honey. Do it. Get a wayside let's, shrine let's for a, sure. A wayside shrine. Uh-huh. That's that's awesome. Okay, tell us a bit more about this, like this initiative. How people can find it, can follow it, can get can get involved. Like, what what are the next steps for somebody? Sure. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, I think uh, not everybody can make it to Leesburg, Virginia, uh, to visit Trinity House Cafe. You know, <laughs> I'm coming. Uh, We're coming. Okay. <laughs> we we do hope there will be other Trinity House cafes in the future. Uh, we're trying to create a model here that could be replicated, but that could take some time. And that's up to the Holy Spirit. Um, a, a real immediate way is that people could go to our website, trinityhousecommunity.org, and just join our e-list. And each week, Ever and I are kind of opening our hearts and sending one email to help just inspire and equip and accompany parents and families. We call it our Heaven in Your Home letter. Um, we have our new book out. That's on Amazon. It's also on Audible. And 
I think the the most concrete embodied way that people could step forward, and it's very exciting because it's now spread to eight states in the United States and Puerto Rico in just one year, uh, but that's to start a Trinity House community group at your parish. And that's just a very simple turnkey plug and play model that brings all uh, brings families together um, five times during the school year. Usually it takes place on a Saturday evening for um, dinner, a brief video discussion among parents and a fellowship over drinks and desserts. Somebody's called it um, date night, family night, and a Bible study all rolled into one. <laughs> and so any parish can um, go on to trinityhousecommunity.org, subscribe and get access to all of those tools that you need to just make it very easy to, to build community in this way. Yeah. <laughs> and you can, if you're one of those people who just really has to hold something, the book is called Heaven in Your Home Letters and Guide, Inspiration and Tools for Building a Trinity House. So I'm I'm one of those people. It's not real unless there's a book about it. <laughs> so you now you can get the book. <laughs> and I gotta say the book is beautiful. So fantastic job, guys. It looks absolutely Thank gorgeous. You. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Um Thanks for being here. This is an awesome initiative. I feel like there's many more conversations that we could have and hopefully we'll have in the future because you guys are phenomenal. And this vision is, I mean, I, for me, it's just at the heart of the church. Like this is, the, the, there's lots of things the church has figured out. There's lots more things the church is figuring out. In 2000 years, there's things that go <laughs> wrong and we, we have to get right again, right? The church as we are all Catholic is constantly reforming, right? But I feel like yeah. right now, in this culture, like this is one of those things that just is going to stand as like that beacon, right? That light on the hill, these families who are intentionally formed, right? Who are going out, who are opening their houses, who are doing weird countercultural things like, you know, keeping the Sabbath holy. Like these things are, <laughs> I, I hope and I pray what's going to bring in so many people into the church who are looking for that thing that the culture is just not got anymore. Right. So kudos, guys. <laughs> and God bless you in that fantastic ministry. That's Thank amazing. you so much, Keith. We really appreciate you having us on. Wonderful being with you. Absolutely. It's been great, guys. Thank you so much. Again, God bless you, the work you're doing for the church. And thanks so much. This has been, this has been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Keith.